Uh, I was invited to uh, give a brief introduction on COVID-19 and uh, the, the 101 on this disease. And I just think it is uh, amazing the number of things that we all know about this disease already that's only been around uh, really for two months in the US. Um, so these are all things that uh, we already know. Uh, these are the things that are kind of repeated in every, every news story that you see. We're talking about SARS-CoV-2. That's the name of the virus. It was first detected in Wuhan, China. It's the illness. Uh, the illness it causes is called COVID-19. And this is a single-stranded RNA virus. Uh, the four proteins uh, start with the nucleocapsid, the end protein, that's the gray stuff that makes up the surface. You've got the envelope and the membrane in, in uh, yellow and orange. And then you've got that red spike protein, uh, which sits out there on the edges. And that's the protein that lets this virus break into human cells by, by knocking on the door of the ACE2 receptors. We know about the symptoms. They appear two to, day, two to 14 days after exposure. Um, the symptoms, cough, shortness of breath, and difficulty breathing are the big ones. Social distancing, we've all experienced it. That's why we're all on Zoom. Uh, we know the FDA has made some uh, pretty interesting moves and, and is um, uh, being the most permissive that I've ever seen the FDA in, in my career in diagnostics, which is about 20 years. And uh, vaccines seen by many as, as the end game here for COVID-19, uh, uh, more than 90 under development, but trials for vaccines are very challenging. Thing. So here's the latest chart. Uh, this is just pulled uh, from Monday data. Um, so far worldwide, we've got 3.4 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, 239,000 deaths. Uh, the U.S. Is, is more than a third of those cases. And if you zoom in to, uh, from the U.S. to Texas and into Travis County, you really see the same curve, right? You see a, a, a long period of, of this disease just getting started. Uh, and then you see a clear break and then you see a somewhat linear looking uh, pattern that is, uh, has a, a big upward trajectory. Uh, and, and just for, for convenience, um, shout out to one of the sponsors here. South by Southwest is pretty much where the elbow of that curve lies where we went from uh, very slow to very quickly. Um, uh, the ratios of confirmed cases and deaths um, is, is somewhat proportional, but you'll see that Texas has about uh, one third the rate of confirmed cases uh, as the US. Travis County and, and Texas track about the same. So in the US, we're looking at about a third of a percent of people are confirmed cases. Texas and Travis County, more like a tenth of a percent of, of people are confirmed cases. Yeah. So my main message on, on COVID and for today is that we all should stay humble uh, and keep investing in research because we don't really know anything. Um, I, I know stuff about this little corner of COVID that's, that's in diagnostics, and that's a small bit of, of what we collectively know, but there is so much more out there. We need to keep researching and keep understanding because we don't, we don't actually understand the answers to how this all ends. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to John Fonder from the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Great, thank you, Eric. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the introduction as well. That kind of gives a, a good background of COVID-19. Um, and really that's the, the place where this presentation picks up. Uh, you know, a, a new disease presented itself. We had a lot of questions on what that would look like. You know, how does it spread? How contagious is it? What are the, what are the symptoms? that people will will have. Um, and I also appreciate Eric saying how much we already know in only a couple of months. Um, and so I'm gonna take a look kind of from, from our perspective on what that process is like. Uh, next slide, please. So for some context on, on who I am and, and my role, uh, I'm part of the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, some colleagues I know have presented it, uh, at uh, Austin Forum in the past, but um, uh, we are a research center that's at the University of Texas. We're located um, on the research campus, so up at, at Burnett and Breaker. And there are around 180 of us, about 70 of us uh, are, are PhD researchers. We span a whole lot of disciplines. I'm in the life sciences computing group, um, but we have a whole lot of different groups uh, kind of representing most of the, the wings of computational science. Uh, and we have been entrusted to build and deploy supercomputers for open science use. So the, the biggest one in our data center right now is, is called Frontera. 
Uh, it is a, the number five most powerful supercomputer in the world. Um, that's pictured on those first two images uh, down below. And, um, and there are a whole lot of different fields of science that, that, that operate on that system uh, and the other systems that we have in, in the data center. We serve about, well, tens of thousands of, uh, of US researchers and their colleagues globally. Uh, and really what we want to do is take the resources that we have and apply them in a way that enables them to make discoveries uh, that will be transformative um, to the world uh, and, and uh, help advance us to kind of next things. And um, next slide. So in many ways, we wanted to take the resources we had and apply them toward COVID-19 uh, in every way that we could. And so we sought collaborations with labs who are working on this problem. Uh, we have 30 plus active collaborations now. Um, these are, are very in-depth collaborations. Um, they include computing resources, uh, you know, compute time and data storage. Uh, they also include a lot of effort from our staff supporting sometimes direct coding, sometimes scaling up their workflows on a, on a large cluster so that they can get their results faster. And uh, in some cases also providing infrastructure like portal infrastructure so that there's a web presence uh, to make it easier to communicate out kind of the findings as they occur real time. So if, if we look at you know, the amount of resources that, that TAC has, um, the, the unit of measurement is called a petaflop, petaflops, uh, which is a million billion uh, floating point operations per second. And in, the, in our data center, we have about 60 million billion of those to, uh, to go around every second. And around 30% of those um, right now are devoted to COVID-19 research. Next slide, please. So with that, I'd like to give four examples of research that we've been working on, uh, just to kind of highlight some of the breadth, some of the depth, some of the things that people are looking at, some of the ways that computing is really helping in the field um, to, to quickly respond to COVID-19. And the first one is work uh, that's under the COVID-19 Modeling Consortium. This is led by Lauren Ansel Myers, um, if she looks familiar, she's been on CNN like four times uh, recently talking about um, the epidemiological models that her group does. Um, she has a, a pretty established history of this, uh, doing the same type of treatment for influenza and has been applying this type of mathematical modeling for, for the coronavirus. Uh, I, you know, I know that, that uh, modeling has been pretty present in the media, so um, just to just to point out, there's not just one type of mathematical model that is in use. So one of the um, staples in the field that's, that's considered good is, is the SEIR model, or sometimes just SIR. This, is, this measures the population, divides the population into groups. Uh, some are susceptible, which is the S. Uh, then they are exposed at some point, the E group, to the, the virus in question. And after some certain amount of time, they can become infected. Uh, after they're infected for a while, they will go into this recovered box with the R of the model. And based on the properties of the virus and the properties of the, the population that it's affecting, uh, you can get a really good prediction about um, what, the, you know, what the outcomes will be over time. And, and this is very effective with influenza. One of the challenges with coronavirus has been that we don't know the virus very well. So we can estimate um, parameters about the virus based on Wuhan data, based on Italy, uh, but there's a constantly growing data set that's, that improves this type of model, um, but inherently it can't be perfect uh, the first time around. But that's not the only type of model that's, been, that's being used, uh, and even in, in Dr. Meyer's group, she's using, uh, there's, there's actually a really neat website um, with, that has live updated projections every day uh, for every for something like 100 metropolitan areas, uh, also divided into states. And this is not using an SERIR model. It's actually using hospitalization data uh, combined with cell phone GPS data. So their lab is able to get aggregate GPS data to uh, get an estimate on how much people are isolating. So um, there is some measure of if how many people went to Quack's Bakery a year ago versus how many people are going now uh, and, and based on that type of thing, we can see how much people are actually obeying these uh, stay home and, and safe rules. Um, and so from that, they can predict some, some time ahead uh, 
what, what will happen so that decision makers can, can help do that. And you can see if you look at just this, this one, uh, the error bars as time goes on changes a lot. And that brings me to my next slide, which is this type of modeling is not at all like weather prediction. So if, if we want to predict what a hurricane coming into land, the hurricane itself does not change. And carrying forward the mathematical model to predict exactly what's going to happen uh, is, is not as challenging as this. Um, here, in many ways, we control the storm. So the, the population data, how we behave, um, how we interact, or how we stay away from each other and, and take precautions um, affects the outcomes here. And so it's, it's been wonderful to see thus far uh, the way that some of the, the dire predictions that modeling has shown have not come true. Um, but it's also important to note that you know, even in our own cities and our own states, these models show a very heterogeneous data set. So uh, in, in fact, right before I came on, the news was just saying the same thing. You know, New York is, is on the decline. They got hit really hard and the curve is dropping for them, but there are other states where that's not the case. Um, this sort of exponential growth period hasn't happened yet. And so these types of models and their ability to drill down into specific areas are a very valuable tool uh, for decision makers. And decision makers have been using them across all levels of government. But I feel like they're also empowering to us because they give us the data to know, you know kind of have to have our own fingers on the pulse of what is going on in our city and in our country uh, to make our own informed decisions. Next slide. So with that, I'd like to talk also about uh, Dr. Rami Amaro's work. Um, so this is uh, very near to, to my heart. This is a lot of my background is in molecular dynamics. Um, if you look on that image on the right, this is the, the artist from the CDC uh, their artistic conception of, of coronavirus. Um, and this was built in a very cool way. It has its own cool story. But it is just that. It's, it's meant to be an artistic thing so that people can get a feel for what a virus looks like. Um, but also there's a lot of value to having a full atom, atomistic model of exactly what the envelope looks like for COVID-19 so that we can look mechanistically at what happens with the S protein that, that Eric mentioned before. Um, and to, to look at how we can interrupt its function so that um, we can cure people, so that people don't get so sick. Uh, and, and then, the, you know, antivirals, vaccines, the whole thing. There's, there's a lot of room to explore that in silico or on, uh, computationally. So next slide. So the, the envelope itself is very large. Uh, it's you know, somewhere around 200 million atoms, which is, is huge. Um, I mean, a couple hundred thousand atoms when I was in grad school was considered pretty big. Uh, so this is truly uh, can only be done on a few machines in the world type simulation. And building that up, um, Rami's group, Dr. Amaro's group, is doing it by looking at um, the individual pieces that appear on the envelope, such as this animation of the S protein itself, and getting a good understanding of its structure and dynamics based on imaging that, you know, information we have from either NMR or crystallography based on the structure of it, the sequencing information, we can build up these atomistic models and then assemble them together into a full envelope. This follows kind of the dogma of molecular dynamics that the sequence, in this case of the virus, will lead to its structure. The structure of the virus is uh, an indicator of its function. And if we have a full understanding of this, we can use fundamental forces of physics to model how it interacts, not only with our, the host biology, um, but also how it can be interrupted by uh, different therapeutics. So the simulation you're watching, this is just a few frames of it, but uh, it was done a few weeks ago on Frontera. I uh, used 4,000 nodes in parallel, um, just for this little piece to give you an idea. Next slide, please. So there are two other groups I want to mention, um, again, for scope. So we have forecasting, we have molecular dynamics. Uh, there's a really cool project going on right now led by Arvind Ramanathan out of Argonne National Labs, um, partly using resources attack and partly using Argonne and other, other supercomputers that are around. They are taking a, uh, they're looking for small molecules that can potentially serve as antivirals. And so they have the structure, just like in the previous uh, side, of a protein that's important to the functioning of coronavirus. And they can actually search for uh, across what really amounts to a billion potential small molecules that can bind and interrupt the function of that protein 
Many of these are available as FDA approved drugs. Others are you know, uh, possibly available off the shelf um, to order from, from chemical companies so that they can go through trials and, and see if they're effective. But the search space is enormous. So to conquer that, they're actually using artificial intelligence to help guide the search of small molecules into regions of interest. They're then doing virtual screening, which is a very kind of low fidelity, but very fast way to see if, uh, if a small molecule has potential as a drug candidate. And then from there, they're doing higher resolution, more accurate simulations to understand really the binding affinity of that molecule to that pocket. Uh, and combining this all in a, in a pipeline that is really neat to see. Next slide. And the last one is probably the most ambitious and probably the hardest to, uh, to really dive into and describe. Um, there's an, an international group of researchers. There's over 100 researchers. I think they represent about 30 institutions. And the, the span of their, their disciplines is huge. Um, I've been working with people that are doing like microbiome type studies, um, so like metagenomic studies. Um, I've been on their calls, there are people talking about um, mitochondrial DNA and, and the way expression of mitochondrial genes changes as people go through the virus. Uh, and there's a whole lot of other things. Uh, their goal is to um, improve treatment options and ultimately develop therapeutics for this virus. And what's really neat about this is the way that they're taking public data sets and they're doing various types of pre-processing and analysis and annotation on genomic data sets, but then they are making them public. Um, so this, this project in and of itself is already a pretty huge collaboration of 100 researchers from so many institutions. And they are working as this collective engine, which is taking a, a data-centric approach to, uh, to taking what we know about the virus, maximizing it, and then making it available across the globe to, to even more researchers. Um, so this is, uh, I wanted to highlight just because it's, it's the type of collaboration that um, we love to see uh, as scientists, right? This is what exactly what we hope happens in science is these large groups of specialists all collaborating together um, with as few barriers as possible. And uh, it's, we're happy to, to support that. Next slide. So the, to summarize kind of from, from my perspective, um, we didn't get to pick coronavirus. It, it came, um, we didn't know we'd be working from home. Here we are. And we are able to choose how we respond to the situation that we've been given. Uh, within the scientific community, from the, the computational side of things, uh, I have seen, one, that, that computational techniques can apply to uh, a lot of different domains. Um, and I see a lot of very smart people uh, taking what they have accomplished in their field and applying it to COVID-19 research uh, in a very a positive way. And then the other thing that I really see from, from where I am is a collaborative mindset where you don't see specific groups trying to be, you know, keep their cards close to the chest on, on what they're doing so they can be the first to publish this or that or, or to develop anything in secret. This is very open. This is very collaborative. Uh, and I think it's set many records on the speed at which the sequencing data and things like that came out. All right, and uh, with that, I'm actually gonna hand it back to Eric Olson. So, all right. Alrighty, thanks, John. Um, I'm gonna bring you on the whirlwind tour of COVID-19 diagnostics. There's a lot of ground to cover and uh, I'll get into some fairly technical areas. So I, I know this is a pretty technical audience, so I hope that's a little bit of fun for you. Um, first slide, please. So diagnostics, is about the measurement of analytes. It's about trying to find certain chemicals in a sample. So this is roughly the pattern of relevant analytes that we look for uh, in COVID-19. Um, so this is the path of an infection uh, with time on the horizontal axis. And if you start with the blue curve, that's the virus itself. So you get infected with the virus and that blue curve starts to come up and that's both the virus protein particles that we've been talking about, as well as the RNA inside of that virus. So that blue curve is the analyte that you want to detect. If you're trying to figure out, is there an actual infection going on? The next curve to come up is the IgM. That is the green curve. That is the uh, short-term immune response. It goes to work fighting the disease. It uh, starts to pick up roughly a week after the initial infection. Uh, comes up, peaks, and then comes back down. 
But then finally, there's the red curve. That's the IgG antibody. And that is the longer term immune response. Uh, that is what ultimately clears the disease and theoretically provides long term immunity. But I want to um, identify a couple of notes from this chart. Uh, first, this is a chart from a company uh, called BioPanda that uh, is doing their best to explain uh, what's going on here. And this is called illustrative because the fact is we don't really know. This has not been adequately measured to date and, and people are just kind of sketching charts at this point. Uh, early uh, science is showing that the IgG does tend to develop a little bit earlier than indica indicated. Uh, you can't be, it can't directly be extrapolated from other diseases. Um, IgG is not proven to remain in the blood. Uh, we don't know if it stays forever. Uh, like an immunity that lasts for a lifetime or if it's something that's going to have to get boosted or if it rises and falls at different rates in different people. And then finally, you've probably heard that IgG is not proven to provide immunity. Um, it's, it's very true that there's a difference between an antibody and a neutralizing antibody that will actually take down a virus and prevent you from getting sick. Um, that's one of the, the big remaining scientific questions in the serology world. So next slide, please. Um, this chart kind of explains why there are two uh, completely different categories of diagnostics going on with COVID. On the left-hand side, we're talking about testing for an active infection. On the right-hand side, we're testing for the immune response. Uh, completely different goals, completely different technologies. So on the left-hand side, uh, we're trying to detect what was on that blue line. We're trying to find the RNA from the virus, or we're trying to identify the protein of that virus. This is actually searching for the virus itself. So in order to do that, this is a respiratory virus, so we need a respiratory sample, which is why you have this lovely picture of that nasopharyngeal swab on the left-hand side. Uh, you can see just how deep it has to go to, uh, to grab that sample reliably. Uh, this primarily uses PCR technology. So that's polymerase chain reaction, which is a process of amplifying RNAs and DNAs uh, by copying them many, many, many times until they become easy to detect. Uh, very solid, very powerful detection technology. There are different types of uh, PCR technologies. The Cepheid technology in the middle is a point of care device. You can see that in the doctor's office. On the right-hand side, you've got a hologic device. That's something you'd see in a large laboratory. Um, some of the key issues on active infection detection and PCR um, uh, can get fairly political, but uh, the testing capacity, the speed with which it started up and the speed with which it has grown uh, has been a, a significant concern. I saw my friend Scott in the chat asking uh, about tests per capita in Texas. Um, the answer there is there, there have been 427,000 tests done in Texas. So you're looking at about 1.5% of the population has been tested. So some of the answers to the questions about what's really going on in Texas, we, we, we only have a sampling of 1.5% of the population there. Um, but once testing capacity started to build for PCR, the swab supply became the major, major issue. Um, uh, getting an accurate swab for PCR tests is critical. It's very easy to get a contamination and it's very easy to miss the actual virus. Uh, which links to sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity is the, the key assay performance indicator on these tests uh, that's going to indicate whether or not we're going to catch that active infection. The immune response, uh, move, moving over to the right-hand side, this is a, a very different test where we're, we're looking for antibodies now. We're not looking for the virus, we're looking for antibodies that your body has developed to that virus. So for that purpose, we're looking at a blood sample. We're not looking at a swab sample. Uh, this is primarily done using immunoassay technology. Um, some of the different technologies uh, for the test are lateral flow cartridges. You can see that device. It's like a pregnancy test in the middle, uh, as well as an automated laboratory. You can see a picture of uh, our laboratory team on the bottom right, so you can see what a high throughput automated laboratory looks like. Some of the key issues here are immunity. So that whole idea of whether antibodies actually give you immunity that you can count on. Regulation, uh, this is the case where the FDA opened the floodgates uh, for serology um, and, and, and did not need to review data in order for products to get onto the market. That allowed uh, hundreds of test kits from uh, manufacturers that 
uh, many hadn't seen before come onto the market with questionable quality. Uh, and just on Monday, the FDA began cracking down and has, has begun the process of shutting down a lot of the test kits that, that should not have been on the market in the first place. Um, unlike the test for the active infection, uh, specificity is really the key issue for immune response testing. Um, specificity uh, refers to uh, being able to make sure that the people uh, that, that you're, you're saying are positive actually are, are positive. Um, and, and being certain about that, because if you're going to put somebody back into circulation, uh, feeling like they have immunity, you want to be very sure before they put themselves into danger. So on the next slide, um, I just want to give a quick background on sensitivity and specificity, which you hear about all the time in the world of diagnostics these days. And some of the statistics behind, behind these may not be totally obvious. So sensitivity means uh, that if you look at a population on the top left, if, if you have 100 people that have the disease, if you have a test with 70% sensitivity, that means if you run the test on 100 people, you're going to get 70 positive results and you're going to get 30 negative results. Those negative results are called fal false negatives because it's the wrong answer. So that's what 70% sensitivity means. On the bottom is specificity. Now we measure 100 people that do not have the disease. Uh, if we do that with a test that has 95% specificity, for example, we'd get 95 negative results and five positive results. Um, so you can see how both of these measures are important and it really depends on where the danger is in, in the test. Uh, so you want to tune these tests to be sensitive and specific depending on the type of population that you have and on the purpose of the test. Which brings us on the next page to the importance of understanding what that population actually is. Uh, so we are just at the very beginning of these seroprevalence studies that are being done around the world to use uh, serology tests for the immune response to try and figure out how many people actually have had COVID-19. It's the only way we're going to do proper epidemiology on this disease. So there, there have been some pretty sizable studies, uh, New York, California, uh, Iran, Germany, and Japan have all done them, and you can see very wildly different numbers on seropositivity. Seropositivity is the percent of the population that that study suggests have ever been infected with SARS-CoV-2. So some pretty shocking numbers. Um, New York City, 21.2%. Um, that's that's 1.8 million people uh, estimated to be seropositive in New York City. Remember that the USA number for confirmed cases is 1.2 million. So these studies are all suggesting that our numbers of confirmed, confirmed cases are off by huge numbers. That's what that underestimation figure is. Um, so the, the, the seropositivity estimate is 11 times larger than the actual number of confirmed cases in New York. And in, the other, in many of the other situations, you see a much bigger number even. So you can point towards the fact that we've had limited diagnostic testing. We haven't tested enough people to understand how many people are infected. Um, you can wonder about the population sampling method. Um, who did you really test? You can question the quality of the serology tests that were used and whether these numbers are accurate. Or are there just other factors that we don't understand yet? Um, I think it's, it's a, a combination of all of those. On the next page, putting this together with the sensitivity and specificity, you can get to a measure called the positive predictive value. So when you're calling somebody seropositive, uh, what's the likelihood that that's accurate? So positive predict predictive value would be start on the left-hand side and take a population that has 10% prevalence. So let's say 10% of people have ever had COVID-19. Those are the, the 10 red ones on the left-hand side of that dashed line. If you had a test which was 90% sensitive and 95% specific, which happens to be the FDA's requirement for serology right now, if you tested those 100 people, you would get nine true positives because you get nine out of 10 right, but you'd also get 4.5 false positives uh, among that negative population. So if you zoom in on them, you've called 13 and a half people positive and only nine of those were the correct answer. So you're down to two thirds, 67% positive predictive value. A third of the cases you call positive, you're actually wrong. So zooming in like this, looking at a, at a population really exposes the importance of, of especially sensitivity in these assays. Next page. 
So I um, wanted to close with just a, a technical example of uh, how one high throughput automated assay works. Uh, this is the assay that, that uh, we have at Babson Diagnostics and I'll share the architecture with you. So we start with a streptavidin latex magnetic microparticle. This is a, a tiny magnetic bead uh, and it's coated with streptavidin. Next slide. That streptavidin makes a landing pad for this biotinylated S1 antigen. So that blue trapezoid is the, uh, is the business end of that spike protein that John showed you. Uh, that's the thing that lets uh, SARS-CoV-2 into the cells. So we take that protein and we stick it through bio and streptavid into a magnetic bead. Next slide. We then add the patient sample into that. That red, uh, red thing is an antibody. That's an IgG antibody to SARS-CoV-2. And once that sample goes in, you notice we've made that mag magnetic complex look kind of like a, like a SARS-CoV-2. Um, that antibody is going to rush to stick to that spike protein uh, because its job is to go and kill those things. We do that and then we use a magnet to hold everything in place and we wash it out because there are about a million other things in that blood sample that we do not want to measure. We just want to measure that antibody. Next slide. The final step is uh, we use a detection reagent, which is a, it's actually a mouse antibody that is specific to the human IgG, uh, and that is labeled with acridinium ester. So we stick that into the complex, we hold the magnet down, we wash it out again to clean out any extraneous material, uh, and then we light it up. That acridinium ester um, produces light. Uh, we use a photomultiplier tube and we count the photons coming out of that reaction uh, to see how much of that IgG for SARS-CoV-2 is in the sample. So this is just a, a quick way to illustrate all of the different measures that we can take to make sure that, that a measurement is as specific as possible uh, when we report a result. Uh, so next slide. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we just wanted to share a little bit about the technology that's going into uh, the diagnostic side and I look forward to the Q&A. So I'm gonna pass over to Sherry Greenberg from Central Health. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, slide please. So Central Health is actually um, a governmental entity, a local government entity here in Travis County. And Central Health collects a property tax and we serve very low income uh, people here in Travis County um, with a goal of making sure that people can get healthcare and stay healthy. And we work with a network of partners to eliminate health disparities to reach what is our vision of Travis County becoming a model healthy community. Some of you may not realize, but there are more than 161,000 Texans and, I mean, excuse me, people in Travis County with no health insurance. And many of them not only don't have health insurance, they don't have a physician. They don't have a doctor to go to. Next slide, please. So, what I want to speak to is actually the view from the ground. Um, we have had some excellent presentations, uh, really doing a great job of explaining uh, modeling and explaining testing. Uh, the view from the ground is really what we're doing with the Austin Travis County Emergency Operations Center, we call it the EOC, and that is a joint effort of the city of Austin, of Travis County, uh, Central Health, uh, the major hospitals, whether it's St. David's or Seton Ascension um, or um, Scott and White, as well as the University of Texas and the Travis County Medical Society and others. So this emergency operations center was stood up weeks ago when uh, the, the pandemic um, arrived here and it's all virtual. We want to talk about technology. Um, you know, there are a couple of people who are actually in the EOC, but the rest of it is virtual. And all of the um, things that the prior speakers have spoken of, we are, um, we are implementing every day in real time. This emergency operations center operates every day. And the modeling that um, he spoke of with, uh, for instance, UT, um, with Lauren, that is the modeling that we are looking at every day. And not only are we looking at that modeling, 
um, which of course is a feat of technology, right? To have the artificial intelligence and um, all of the math and all of the data, and then to be able to look at it virtually online, right, as a, as a group. But not only are we looking at that, but we are feeding in the data. So yes, we know um, that there is no perfection and that we are perhaps dealing with imperfect data. And in fact, we have no alternative because as we've talked about with the uh, amount of testing and the number of tests and the fact that we're not doing random testing, no, we can't have perfect data. But we have data that from a public policy standpoint is enabling us to make decisions. And that's really important. And we have many people who are feeding in data every day um, with UT uh, Del Med and with Lauren and her team, whether it is the PPE we have available, right? The personal protective equipment in Travis County, whether it's the number of hospital beds, the number of ICU, ICU beds, the number of uh, ventilators. And so all of that is feeding in and we are looking at these models then every single day to make all kinds of decisions. We also have robust communications. And something I wanna emphasize here is that this has been from my standpoint, a huge technology acceleration within healthcare. Um, and I say that because many aspects that we've talked about from a technology standpoint that were not probably implemented to the extent that some of us would have liked, all of a sudden they just went on steroids, right? All of a sudden overnight, um, we see our communications have ramped up, yes. Um, we were using um, social media, we were using YouTube, but now we're using YouTube to have videos for people of very low income to use materials within their homes to make their own cloth masks. Okay, that's just an example. We have, um, we are using uh, texting and um, on the next, there's a slide of resources where I could show you where you can go to um, resources at Central Health and others. But we now have a new app where members of the community can sign up for text message updates. Because we know that there are members of our community who are very low income and they have phones, but they no, may not be smartphones or they have smartphones, but they can't afford data plans or they don't have the kind of devices. But just about everyone has a phone where they can receive a text. So we have a brand new um, text messaging app for instance, that we're using. So that's just another example from a communication standpoint. When we talk about telehealth, again, um, this has been a rapid acceleration at, um, at community care, which are the health centers affiliated with central health. We rapidly went to a situation and because of PPE, um, we didn't have the personal protective equipment for people to be coming in for a lot of medical appointments. We needed to save that for our COVID testing that we started at our Hancock Center and now we're doing um, rotating mobily also in Eastern Travis County. So supply chain issues, right? We need to save that PPE. And so we immediately went to uh, telehealth and about 70% of the people that we're now seeing through our clinics is through telehealth. And again, a lot of that is simply with an actual telephone, right? Not, doesn't have to be with um, fancy laptops and whatnot, but there is a lot that we are doing really with telephone health and of course others, but that has rapidly accelerated, not just with central health, but all over Travis County. Um, so those are real time accelerations, real time technology, um, accelerations and we're not going back. I think this is really, you know, we, we've taken great leaps in a very short amount of time and I, and I don't see us going back from that standpoint. In fact, I only see it accelerating further. The um, testing, of course, is of paramount concern uh, to all of us and to all of us in the emergency operations center. And so these issues that were discussed, what type of tests are the tests um, accurate? How do you get the tests? Can we get the rapid tests? Where do we deploy the tests? So using that data and modeling, we can look to see, are we having hotspots? And, and can we deploy the tests where we see those hotspots? Are we seeing, for instance, that construction workers, um, that we're seeing a lot of illness there? Can we then deploy uh, mobile testing to those hotspots? How rapidly can we get the test results? In the beginning, it was taking a couple of weeks because there was such a backlog. 
and because we now have some tests that are more rapid. So that has all uh, been very important. The contact tracing, of course, is of great importance. And we're using technology there too. It's not Big Brother, we're not you know, following you by name, but you can use, as was stated, the GIS locations, right? We can compare that to how people were congregating last year. We can heat map people to see, in fact, if we're making a difference. And also the Emergency Operations Center set up quite a few task forces. And these task forces, again, are virtual. Um, I'm sure, as with all of you, not only have we accelerated uh, technology with whether it's um, different types of communication or with contact tracing, but just our communications, right? So the Emergency Operations Center, for instance, we're on you know, Teams and we're using that and you can look at slides and whatnot. Um, Zoom, um, Central Health, our board meetings are through Ring Central, but it's using Zoom. You know, on any given day, all of us are on many different platforms. And there's been a, a big learning curve, but I think that people and even the people that we serve have really uh, risen to that uh, challenge. But the task forces are dealing with things such as homelessness and what you do with, uh, about that and people who are homeless. So we have sent teams out, um, uh, Central Health with others to, for instance, the ARCH and others to do testing. And that did lead down, lead to a shutdown of the ARCH, but um, we had located in the city of Austin and signed contracts with some um, hotels where those people could move. So this gets into the testing, right? You heard about the, the isolating and the contact tracing, okay? And those are all very important. Other task forces deal with everything from immigration to uh, food insecurity, for instance. And of course, all of this is helping us make public policy because that's what we have to do. We have to make policy decisions on a daily basis about um, public health, about the economy, about supply chain, about PPE, about where, where and how do we deploy our resources. So these are very important. Next slide, please. Speaking of resources, I did want to give some links here to some resources. So uh, the first one is Central Health and Community Care. It takes you to the COVID website. And from that, you can get to everything um, that I was talking about with Central Health and Community Care. From that platform, you can see you know, how and where you go for testing, how you sign up if you're eligible for um, our um, services through um, the the MAP program, as we call it, which is for extremely low income people. You can see how you sign up to get those um, text messages. So that's all there. Then the City of Austin COVID-19 website, which again um, is through the City of Austin, Austin Public Health there, many, many resources, too numerous to even um, try to go into now. The same thing with the next one, the Travis County COVID-19 website, again, resources from COVID-19 about COVID-19 and both of those, the City of Austin COVID-19 website and the Travis County COVID-19 website show every day the dashboard. And you've seen these dashboards, you know, from cities and counties all over the country. So we have our own dashboard and daily by six o'clock PM, the dashboard is updated to show uh, what we are seeing to the best of our ability with the data that we can get in the testing um, the disease within Travis County and also others. So um, th that is also available to you on both of those websites. Uh, Connect ATX um, gives you a lot of resources. The online Austin Public Testing Enrollment Form. This is something new rolled out about a week ago where you can now get online to that website um, and online um, enroll anybody for, for testing. Um, telehealth, this link gives you um, many different resources for telehealth throughout our community, not just central health, but many others. Food assistance, I know that this has been on many of our minds. And so uh, this is just one of the resources that you can go to for food assistance. This one is through the Central Texas Food Bank. And then I put up another one, which is rent assistance, because of course, for many people, um, both the food and the rent have become a big issue. In the task forces, we have a social services task force, 
because we know that there are people in our community who are isolated. We know there are elderly people who are not living in facilities, they're living on their own, or people in Eastern Travis County who may not have transportation and couldn't walk to a grocery store if they wanted to because it's 10 miles away. So these are very important how to, of course, how to get that type of food assistance. And with the rent assistance, not everyone can work from home, right? Some people um, have been, were furloughed immediately. Others, because of what we've seen with the economy, have been furloughed. And so the um, city of Austin has um, put aside some money for rent assistance. And so I think that this is a, another important resource. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So today happens to be Giving Tuesday, right? And this is the um, hashtag Giving Tuesday Now, which is a special Giving Tuesday hashtag for COVID-19 to help during COVID-19. So I wanted to put that up front and center. Today is Giving Tuesday and the hashtag Giving Tuesday Now. But I also listed some other resources for those of you who want to help and volunteer. And again, all of these will be available on the uh, Austin Forum website, I know, all of these slides. Altogether ATX, the ATX for ATX, Keep Austin Fed, how you can actually help um, with getting food to people or supplies or donating. Contact tracing volunteers. I mentioned contact tracing and we know how important all of that is. Once we have identified somebody who is positive to see who all of the people they have been around, notify them and do that contact tracing. So this is a website where you could sign up to be trained as a volunteer to do contact tracing. Help Seniors is just many of the websites for uh, seniors. And then the last one I have is a how to volunteer uh, website with uh, Giving City Austin. So uh, with that, I will um, conclude and welcome any of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the presenters. And now I'm very pleased to introduce Quan Collins, a collaborator and friend. She works with SAIC. She's on the advisory board for the forum. She participates in the Austin Smart City Consortium as well, Austin City Up. Uh, welcome, Quan. Thanks so much, Jay, and excellent presentation, speakers. So thank you. And thanks to everyone that contributed questions. So. I'll apologize ahead of time if I don't select your question, but we, we only have a little bit of time. So let's see. Juan, Jessica and I were chatting on in the chat window yes. between us. We're gonna try to get more of the questions answered via the Slack channel, the Slack's workspace after this. So um, you, you can ask as many as you can fit into the time and just for all the attendees, we'll try to get additional ones answered in the Austin Forum Slack workspace. Excellent, thanks Jay. All right, can you hear me all right? by the way. Great. Okay. Yes. So first question, um, a relevant question to figuring out risk is not the current rate of COVID-19 infections or deaths, but how many people say per thousand are current active carriers, whether symptomatic or not? Uh, the question is how do we determine uh, whether or not it's safe to go to certain places? In this case, the question was around like to a, a specific grocery store, but are there, are there ways to model like the safety score of a sp particular area? I heard the word model, is that directed toward me? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so the, the number of people who are actively contagious per thousand um, is, the, is the infection rate, right? And that's, that's definitely part of the model, definitely an important part. One that is a little bit difficult to estimate given the, uh, given that we don't have, enough, we don't have the testing to, to fully elucidate that value. Um, mm -hmm. For sure, we have you know, some data that's, that's local, not granularly enough to know which HEB is the safest. Uh, you know, the modeling efforts do get better and better. Um, they're focused, I know there are a couple of questions on the modeling and kind of what data is going into them now. Um, really interesting modeling work around, um, you know, where nursing homes are located and, and the staff that are helping them and how to make sure that our most vulnerable parts of the population stay safe. Uh, the rest of us, you know, taking precautions, the data supports that um, the people you see per week, the less risk you have per month of, of getting infected when you go out, uh, that also is a, a huge uh, 
um, safety measure that is effective. Awesome, thanks, John. All right, the next question uh, talks about long-term solutions to the COVID crisis, right? We we've heard about herd immunity and the need for a vaccine. What are the other options, uh, solutions, right, that will really help us see an end to the, the quarantine and lockdown? Well, I know we haven't stumped our speakers, so feel free to speak yeah. up, Eric. Yeah. Who, who's that for, Juan? Eric, you're on. No, up. Eric, yeah, why don't, why don't you take this one, Eric? Um, sure, I think uh, if, if you call the end of this uh, the eradication of COVID-19, then I think those are probably the two main ones, that, that it's uh, herd immunity or vaccination. Um, I think the, the trick with vaccination is going to be that um, we don't know how effective vaccines are going to be and we don't know once you get vaccinated how long it's going to last and, and if you're going to know how long it's going to last is it you know there, there are some estimates between six months and two years so it could be a complicated process of getting vaccinated making sure your titer stays at a certain level and mm -hmm. then getting vaccinated again um, so uh, we don't know how that how that ends i think um, a lot of people are are additionally starting to think about what uh, you know, what is life like if this becomes a seasonal illness or, or, or a perpetual issue that, that we continue fighting it? You know, we've, uh, you know, we've not eradicated a lot, a lot of diseases as a, as a species. Um, so uh, I think these are all potential outcomes. So I can add to that on, um, we must think about until we see a point where we have herd immunity and vaccinations combined hopefully to have this not be the um, serious risk that it is now what do we need to constantly be looking at as far as our modeling yeah are we going to see another peak in june or august or october those peaks will lessen but are we going to see those what will this mean when we're just beginning now to look at modeling to combine this with flu for instance and um, what does this mean for um, large institutions such as universities, right, which many universities are now uh, analyzing and trying to make decisions about how, how and when do you bring back, for instance, students? And do you do a combination of online teaching and in-person where the large classes, let's say, would be um, online? but smaller classes would be in person and you could use large auditoriums. But then you have to think about, well, you would have both, for instance, um, professors and students with underlying um, situations with, um, they could have immune systems that are compromised. So how do you deal with this? I, I think that um, it's complicated and it is something that we will you know, continue to model and to analyze. If I can just add one point to, to on the intent of that question, right? If the, if the question is, do I have to, to self-quarantine for a year and a half until the vaccine comes out, if it takes that long, or just like rip off the Band-Aid and go get sick right now with COVID-19, so I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, there's definitely, that you know, definitely don't go get sick. <laughs> um, right. A couple of things there. One, uncontrolled outbreaks uh, tend to infect, well, the model show that they infect more of the population than would be necessary for herd immunity. So by controlling the, the outbreak, by slow flattening the curve, um, there are people who won't get infected who otherwise would have in an uncontrolled outbreak. Mm -hmm. also, and please consider that the medical community gets better in its treatment. So we, we should see the, the uh, fatality mortality rate go down over time as we get better with antivirals, with different interventions, at taking those who would otherwise um, and, and saving them. So there are many reasons why protecting ourselves and protecting others is, is a very good thing, no matter what the end game ends up being. I, I concur with that. And I think, um, you know, you have to do a risk assessment, assessment. We know that there are certain populations who really should continue to cocoon, either because of age or because of underlying conditions, for instance. Awesome, thanks, John and Sherry. 
All right, so John, you mentioned um, Lauren Ansel Myers and using flu models, right, to, uh, to apply to COVID-19. There's a question relating to comparing COVID-19 to uh, average annual flu cases, death rates. Uh, can you speak a little bit more to that? Sure. Um, so there, there are lots of comparisons that can be made. Uh, you know, if, if you look at people who are experiencing the symptoms, um, the, you, there are many stories of people who are experiencing symptoms that are far worse than the flu. Mm -hmm. The actual mortality rate, you know, some people feel that the mortality rate is very low or could be very low. I just want to remind uh, everyone that, you know, we affect the storm in this way. So the, the mortality rate was potentially very high if we'd overwhelmed our hospital system. Uh, the better we get at, at treating patients, the lower this should go. And I'd love to see it get down to the same levels of, of influenza. Uh, but that's, that's sort of a numbers game that's not relevant. We know that the symptoms are more severe than the flu. Uh, we, it's very contagious. There's, there's evidence that you know, it could be in aerosol form and things like that, which is still very much an, an ongoing point of research. Um, so with, with respect to comparing it to the flu, uh, I think there are a lot of similarities. I mean, this is a, a SARS type virus has some very um, severe symptoms with the way it attacks cells rich in ACE2. And uh, it definitely needs to be given its due consideration. And I think we're, we're seeing that, that for the, the number of deaths that normally occur. Uh, we've seen a spike in, in this past month. Awesome. Thanks, John. All right, there are a number of natural language reporting platforms for infectious disease outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. ProMed is one of these, uh, International Society for Infectious Disease, and is credited with identifying COVID-19 as an atypical pneumonia in Wuhan early on. At TAC, what steps have been taken to incorporate existing reporting and prediction tools to develop forward-looking technologies? How can the private sector or public-private partnerships support your efforts? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, it's, it's a very thoughtful one. Um, I actually already read it and was kind of hinting at, at some of the answers. So uh, Lauren's, uh, Dr. Meyer's group has um, gotten a number of different types of data. The aggregate GPS data I thought was really cool, a really creative way to estimate how well people were self-isolating. Um, I don't know of of some of the specific questions. I know thermometer data was mentioned in, in there. Uh, and I know as far as natural language processing, there have been groups that are using Twitter um, to understand you know, people reporting that they're sick, but also sentiment, uh, whether they intend to actually stay at home when they're supposed to stay at home and not, uh, and using that to sort of, of track um, potential spots. So there are a lot of both natural language uh, resources that are being pulled in and you know, very creative things to do that, that type of forecasting. Um, as far as the, the things I know about very specifically that are active, um, that's where I was alluding to where nursing homes are, and where people are in nursing homes, you know, what resources they have around them. Um, you know, the, the populations are, are very disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And in many ways, it is brutally culling the most vulnerable of our <laughs> population uh, that need to be protected. And so models that are focused in those areas uh, with a lot of geospatial data, because remember that there's, there's the viral component. So the more we know about the virus, the better, but there's the population component. So the more we know about the population, the behaviors, who interacts with who, um, the more specific uh, we can put in those um, precautions that people take to make sure that they're protected. And I would add, when you talk about, we have to look at various populations and we know from a public policy standpoint that what we call total institutions are very susceptible, right? So whether it's a nursing home or a prison, these are situations where people are confined and they live within that total institution. And you, because of the nature of that, have great susceptibility um, within these total institutions. Great. Uh, is there any evidence of early COVID-19 transmission prior to January? And can this be proven? Anybody? Do any of you want to take that one? 
I mean, the uh, first yeah, evidence of it was in the news today, from. right? Didn't someone uh, didn't someone find somebody in France from December uh, with a sample that was positive? But to your I mean, knowledge in the data that you guys have examined, um, are you seeing any uh, evidence of, of earlier transmissions? Was the question, did it, was it transmitted outside of the Wuhan area before yeah. January? Okay. So, so I guess that for the, that's the question for the panelists. Is there any, is there any data that it, it escaped from the Wuhan area and, and went beyond that um, before January? And that's, for me, that's just outside of what I know. I mean, that's good forensic science that can be done, but as far as the forward looking, I, I don't know how much it changes. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, I don't have that data. I think as, as uh, Eric was saying, you know, you can Google it. There are some um, stories popping up now where um, in various places, they, they seem to perhaps be identifying people who had the disease earlier than they had thought. And someone has posted in the chat window a BBC News article right. relevant to this as well. So Yes, I've seen several relevant where, yes, where people are finding now some isolated, I would say, um, occurrences of people having the disease um, before they had thought it was present in their community. All right, so I know I'm at my time, I think over time for questions. Uh, Jay, back to you. 